Translucent porcelain from China. Exquisite tapestries from France. And stained glass from the monasteries and abbeys of old Northern Europe. Nine thousand priceless objects, representing four thousand years of human creativity, all assembled by just one man. It's the richness and scale of this collection which makes it so fascinating. But what's equally fascinating and intriguing is what sort of person would put a collection like this together. That was William Burrell. Burrell was a truly outstanding collector, and he deserves to be much better known. Burrell has the most outstanding examples of Dugar in any collection in Europe. There are also extraordinary examples of Chinese art. The Islamic art collection is world class. It's an astonishing collection. You will not be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else no, like it in here. No, not only in here, anywhere. Gifted to the city of Glasgow in 1944, the Borough Collection is so vast that less than half is on public display. I can't believe this is down in the store. I can't believe this is down in the store. The story of William Burrell is also the story of Glasgow, the second city of empire at its peak. It's the story of a man who made a fortune out of shipping and spent it on art. And his very own castle. It just looked like a museum. It was absolutely beautiful. A husband and father whose public success hid personal sadness. A patron so private, he never commissioned his own portrait. There's very few accounts of him. He didn't write an autobiography. And yet this is his memorial. He wanted something kept together. Burrell made a huge impact on the city of Glasgow, yet we know almost nothing about him. But I've always wondered what drove him to make his fortune and spend a lifetime amassing this unique collection. The family wealth had been lost, and I think this was a great impetus to Willie because, first of all, he wanted to regain the money which had been lost, and later on, he hoped to regain the status. Whatever motivated the man, his collection ensured that his name will never be forgotten. There is nothing quite like this anywhere in the world. The Burrell Collection opened its doors in 1983 with great fanfare. The Queen turned the key and for the first time the cornucopia of artefacts which had languished in crates and dusty storerooms was displayed for all to see in its purpose-built home, some of it built into the fabric of these very walls. I remember how excited I was when the burrow opened. It was the first time I'd seen the wonders of the world in a modern setting, and each time I come, I'm rewarded when my eye catches something I've never noticed before. Burrell has been described as the millionaire magpie grabbing anything that glittered. A first century Roman sculpture here, a seventh century Chinese warrior there. But I don't think that's true. Burrell developed great passions and then he pursued them. He spent his money carefully, very carefully, amassing this extraordinary collection, piece by hand-picked piece. A collection he hoped would raise the Burrell family to the highest echelons of society. William Burrell didn't have a very smart beginning at all because he was born in a three room tenement in Glasgow and he was the third child to be born there, so it was fairly full of people. That was in 1861. His mother was a dressmaker, and uh, I'm pretty sure that she fitted all the children out with clothes made by herself, 
and they had to scrape to exist. And he was brought up on this and he was made to scrape. And he really appreciated the value of thrift and he never, ever forgot. At the end of the 19th century, Glasgow offered many ways to get rich for those prepared to take the risk. Burrell's grandfather started out shifting cargo on the city's canals. But the era of industrialization soon opened up Glasgow to the greater riches of the empire. In just two decades, the Burrell family went from moving barges to commissioning Clyde-built steamships for their worldwide freight business. William left school aged just 14 to try his hand in the family firm. These were William Burrell's daily surroundings. Burrell and Sons offices were here on George Square as it was being built into the prestigious heart of this booming industrial city. And a few streets away were the burgeoning commercial art galleries and auction houses where William Burrell headed at every opportunity. He started off apparently when he was 14 and he did manage to bid for a picture successfully and it was a portrait of a lady and he got it for a few shillings and he was very pleased and brought it back. And father, who I think was not that way inclined, said, for goodness sake, really, why don't you spend the money on a cricket bat? And then he realised that he had no frame. And so he thought, well, I haven't got a frame and I can't afford to get a frame. And so he took it back and resold it and lost money on the transaction. <laughs> but his early mistakes as a teenage collector didn't put Willie Burrell off. It's a complete treasure trove. We don't quite know where his passion for paintings came from, but Glasgow in the 1880s wasn't a bad place to start. Burrell was excited by a group of contemporary artists known as the Glasgow Boys, whose work he could buy on his doorstep. Burrell's favourite was Joseph Crawhall. One of the best things about this is you get the sense of speed, because the Dachshunds' ears are flying, the feet are going. Yeah. She's not remotely steady in the no. bicycle. She looks like she's wobbling, and it's so delicate, just these little touches of colour. And again, in this one, you get the real sense of excitement and of the huge hindquarters of this racing horse and the splash, which is the tail up. Burrell's passion for Crawhall's work would last a lifetime. But he was also starting to collect artists of international renown like James McNeil Whistler. We have quite a number of lovely Whistler drawings and prints in the collection, and this is one of two um, pastels that we have. And clearly he loved works in paper, he loved pastels, and he loved colour. Mm -hmm. I mean, would part of the reason that he did uh, concentrate on pastel sometimes and works on paper is they tend to be cheaper than the oils? Well, there is that too. And he and was canny. Yeah, he was canny, because um, he definitely buying things quite early on that are not expensive. He's not buying, on the whole, the larger oil paintings that are going to be more expensive. But what about Whistler oils? Well, Whistler is still relatively cheap. He's buying early on, so the... So the he bought the early value, Whistler oils yeah, as well? Yeah, so the... Value is not rocketing. William Burrow bought two impressive oil paintings by Whistler, spending £1,500 on the fur jacket alone, but sold them both just a few years later. Luckily for us, Burrow didn't sell all his Whistlers. Oh my goodness, it's one of the Westminster. You could just make out the lights along the far bank and the factory chimneys, but just, just and no more. And what I like about this is many artists at the time were doing narrative paintings, so paintings that have a story. Mm -hmm. Well, this is something that's evoking a mood 
And what I love is the fact that Burl obviously cared about that. I can't believe this is down in the store. I can't believe this is down in the store. Yeah, we should have this one to display. It's a really wonderful nocturne. I'm very glad I didn't sell this. Burl was not only buying and selling paintings, he was also commissioning new works. He asked Glasgow boy John Lavery to paint his youngest sister, Mary. This must be one of the most beautiful, elegant portraits in the collection. She's very elegant, isn't she? William Burrell preferred to stay out of the limelight, but he was happy to show off the family's growing wealth with this arresting portrait. What this says to me is, this is my sister, I want Lavery to paint her, and I want to show her off to the world. Burrell's world had changed immeasurably. By the 1890s, he was at the helm of the family business, and business was booming. Burrell and Son's ships were now carrying cargo to ever farther flung reaches of the globe. And as his company and his bank balance grew, so did Burrell's infatuation with buying art. Letters written by Burrell's best friend, Robert Lorimer, offer a rare eyewitness account of his activities. He travels pretty well all over Europe two or three times a year, visiting their agents. He's 36. He possesses 17 Matthew Maris's, two Whistlers, God knows what else. Really, he is very fine taste. God knows where he got it. Burl headed to the continent to make his first purchases of European art, where the bargaining techniques he'd picked up in the cutthroat world of global shipping served him very well indeed. That man's a perfect nailer. To see him tackling some of these dealers was a treat, and in many ways, I learned a lot from him. The generation that Burl belonged to were a bit more daring mm -hmm. in their purchases, and they were interested in buying modern European art. Uh, and I think that's probably because they were perhaps more international in their outlook. And if you think about the businesses that they ran... You think and they travelled. They travelled, and Burrell was sending ships off here, then everywhere. And so they had a more international outlook. Burrell was also buying top-quality French and Dutch art from a handful of dealers in Glasgow. So the Burrell's got at least as many Degas as any other collection yes. in the United States. And through them, some of the best modern art in the world found its way into William Burrell's hands. The collector fell for the work of a living French artist who was helping to change the face of Western art, Edgar Degas. Now this is one of Degas's most important paintings, and it's certainly one of the best of his works that Burrell purchased. Mm -hmm. The man that we're seeing here, Duronti, was an art critic, a novelist, and a close friend of Degas. And in 1876, Duronti wrote a pamphlet called The New Painting. And what he was saying was, when you're doing a portrait, show them in their own environment and tell us something about them. In other words, you can look at that portrait and you know, without knowing, what this man actually did a writer, completely surrounded by his books and pamphlets. So this was the whole idea, this idea of modernity showing real life in art. Absolutely. And Burrell loved Degas, but one of the artists he also loved from a modern point of view was Manet. And this was exhibited in 1880 at an exhibition called La Vie Moderne. À Paris, dans chaque faubourg, le soleil de chaque journée. These voyeuristic snaps. 